This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. If you like us, please join our community of supporters by giving to our Patreon campaign. You'll find it on our homepage, tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll see a big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. We're counting on you. I'm Dahlia Shenlin. And I'm Gilad Halpern. Every week we'll be talking about books and research and other things that have caught our attention. Our guest today is Jeffrey Kopstein. He's a professor and chair of political science at the University of California, Irvine. In his research, Professor Kopstein focuses on inter-ethnic violence as well as European and Russian Jewish history. His book, co-authored with UC Berkeley's Jason Wittenberg, is called Intimate Violence, Anti-Jewish Programs on the Eve of the Holocaust. It was published this year, published recently by Cornell University Press. Jeffrey Kopstein, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, thanks for having me. So the book focuses on pogroms that took place between the start of the Second World War and the Final Solution. What are the analytical or historiographical merits of focusing on pogroms in that uh, period? After all, you know, pogroms were not new in Poland at the time. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good question. Most people who study the Holocaust study it as one big thing. Right? That took place, the six million Jews died between this, you know, basically between 1941 and 1945. The problem is, is it's so big that it makes it essentially uncomparable with anything else, apart from the moral issues of it being uncompar- incomparable with anything else. And what we've done in this book is we've taken an episode. And there was an episode that happened from the end of June. That's from when the Germans invade the Soviet Union with three million soldiers along a huge you know, thousand-mile front. And as they pass through very quickly, they say to the locals, look, go ahead, do whatever you want, kill your Jewish neighbors. And in about 10% of places where the Germans pass through, the locals, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Poles, Romanians, turn against their Jewish neighbors and massacre them in the most brutal way possible. So we're we're really talking about neighbor-on-neighbor violence. The earlier pogroms, right, let's say the ones from 1918 to 1920, that had largely been warlordism. Right? That was roving bands of people on, on cavalry, on horses, going from village to village. The phenomenon we're interested in here is why is it under the right circumstances neighbors turn on neighbors? Multicultural communities turn toxic. And we think that that's actually comparable with other places, and we can learn a lot from Jewish history to help explain other places. And what are the right circumstances? Is it the disintegration of power, of disintegration of norms? Right. Well, I mean, when you ask normal people, why did these pogroms happen? Why did they happen? The normal response is, well, anti-Semitism, right? And we're not denying, of course, anti-Semitism is a factor. If everybody loved Jews, there'd never be a pogrom anywhere under any circumstances. But what this study allows us to do is to look at very kind of beloved, cherished hypotheses among historians and social scientists and to say, which ones work and which ones don't. And so let's just take anti-Semitism for one moment. The problem with that as an explanation is not that it wasn't present. It was. The problem is that it's everywhere. In a way, it's too strong to account for why they didn't happen. If it was anti-Semitism alone, you would have expected more pogroms to have happened and not. Same with, let's say, give another hypothesis, the presence of the Germans. The Germans were everywhere. The Germans had invaded. There were the, and we can talk a little bit more about this, the Einsatz group, and that is this mobile killing units had been deployed by the Nazis, and they were charged with killing Jews and communists. But clearly they weren't up to the task because it didn't succeed everywhere, and they didn't succeed at instigating pogroms everywhere. And so that itself falls apart as an explanation, and there are other explanations that fall apart. And eventually, I suppose, we'll settle. We'll talk about the one that we do like. Let's start with the methodological question. You really try to use quantitative methods here, social science, to look at the empirical factors to help us isolate, or the empirical data, to isolate which factors are, you know, causal factors rather than just correlated. And you're really trying to make order out of all of these different potential explanatory factors. 
What is the value of that particular approach, this quantitative empirical approach to quantifying aspects of human behavior that are so barbaric that you almost feel like they can't fit into clear numbers-based approach? Well, I mean, this is the kind of thing, you know, that the study of the Holocaust and also all, all violent human behavior, which elicits an emotional response, right? And why does this happen? And the reason most people say why this kind of thing happens is because of hatred. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's clearly a necessary condition. What, when you quantify like this, so what we've done, we've created a database of 2,000 cities, towns, and villages on the Eastern Front at the beginning in the first month and a half of World War II. And what that allows us to do is not only to say where pogroms happened, but perhaps even more importantly, where they didn't happen. Which is and a big part of your thesis, all you the ones that didn't happen. I mean, social science tells you if you don't have variation, if you don't have variation, you can't offer an explanation. You could offer hypotheses, and clearly all of these things matter. Looting, anti-Semitism, the presence of the Germans, the previous presence of the Soviets, all of which we should talk about. But you can't make, as you say quite correctly, you can't make sense of this to order the hypotheses, to actually say, okay, what mattered and what didn't. So there are lots of places in which they hated Jews, and they didn't do pogroms. There were lots of places in which the Jews were rich, and they didn't come and steal their stuff. There were lots of places where the, the Soviets had been everywhere, and they didn't kill the Jews. And, of course, the Germans were everywhere, and they only killed Jews in 10% of places. So those kinds of things, while may have, they may have been necessary conditions, indeed, they were absolutely necessary conditions. They could not have been sufficient conditions. We need to look for other things. But that does not distract from the potency of pogroms as, you know, as a political phenomenon. I mean, just like Palestinian violence in Israel doesn't affect all Israelis, yet still it's, it is really the bedrock of the Israeli-Palestinian dynamic. The same for, I don't know, look at uh, anti-Semitism in France today. I mean, it, France has the largest Jewish community in, in Europe and anti-Semitism is on the rise, yet the great overwhelming majority of French Jews do not, are not directly affected by anti-Semitism, yet it is their in the air. Do you think that you miss on the psychological factor here? Certainly. And we're not trying to explain the impact of these pogroms. We're trying to look at the causes of them. And, you know, clearly, I mean, there had been pogroms in 1941. There had been earlier pogroms. What's interesting is those earlier pogroms for, let's say, the last great round before the one in 1941 was really right after the Russian Revolution and from 1918 to 1920. And the first thing we did is we tried to find a list of where those pogroms happened. And so we went to YIVO in New York City, which is the, the Jewish Historical Institute, and I found primitive spreadsheets of where pogroms happened from 1918 to 1920. And I said, jackpot, I'm going to be able to match these earlier pogroms on these later pogroms. They don't match at all. They were actually, the earlier pogroms were to the east, were more in central Ukraine and southern Ukraine, and not so much in northeastern Poland and western Ukraine. And what did that mean, that you were looking at different locations that involved different socio-cultural political factors that led to those pogroms? Exactly. So the factors that led to these pogroms in 1941 were different than led the ones that led to the pogroms in 1918-1920. Those pogroms in 1918-1920, they were mostly not neighbor-on-neighbor -neighbor violence. They were mostly roving bands of warlords. And that's what, you know, in the Jewish historical memory, it's very important. And in fact, it leads to an upswing not only in Bundism but Zionism, but not in the villages that we look at. The Zionist parties do become powerful and it becomes an important part of our explanation in the towns and villages we care about. But these were a kind of a, a new phenomenon, something that were different in the area that we're talking about. The grassroots nature of the pogroms that you talk about raises, you know, an important question here, or perhaps a distinction, is what qualifies as a pogrom, right? When does a fist fight spill over into, into a pogrom? Right. We, we're very careful about that. We say, look, if the Germans just came into a town and killed everybody, we don't code that, if you will. We don't call that a pogrom. There has to be significant local non-Jewish participation against non-armed, unarmed Jewish civilians. And we say there has to be a death. There has to at least be a death in a way where we're letting them off lightly because you can have a pogrom with no deaths. You could have rapes. You could have just um, property destruction. You can have humiliation. All those things took place in the pogroms we're talking about, plus there were murders. 
in the, and in the case of some of them, a lot of murders. And we can talk about that, too. That's a very clear definition. I want to, of course, talk about the political findings. In other words, when you go through all of these factors and theories and hypotheses, you come up with the idea that the one that is among the strongest predictors of pogroms is the perception of threat to Polish political dominance. Can you talk about what that means? Yeah, so let me tell you about what we did. So first of all, I had to find out where the pogroms happened and where they didn't. And for that, we used narratives, mostly narratives that were taken down by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw from 1945 to 1947, right after the fact. And that's very important because look, nobody had seen Schindler's List yet. <laughs> nobody knew what to say. They didn't even, of course, they weren't using the word Holocaust. They simply described the first events after the Germans invade, and the word pogrom comes up in them. And these are, these are excellent documents. They're mostly in Polish, some in Yiddish, some in Hebrew. Some are then repeated later on at Yad Vashem, where the, some details are, are changed. So from that, we can code where were there pogroms and where there were not. Then we wanted to figure out, okay, what kinds of places were these? What was their nature? So we looked at census data. Did there, was there a lot of Jews or few Jews, right? So the census data is broken down by nationality and by religion. And there were two censuses in Poland, 1921 and 1931. They were going to do one in 1941, but the Germans got in the way of Stuff that, obviously. So that's who lived there. So we know if there were a lot of Jews or few Jews. The second thing we did is we looked at voting data, right? And we looked at what kind of parties did the people who lived in these villages vote for, in these villages and towns, right? Were the Poles super nationalist or were they kind of mellow, right? Were the Jews, did the, were the Jews Bundists? Did they, were they ultra-Orthodox voting for Agudat Yisrael? Or were they Zionists? That is, were they nationalists? And so based on that, what we expected to find is not what we found. Well, the book That's we, always good in social science. The book but... we thought we were going to write was we were going to show that in those places where there were a lot of Polish nationalists, where there, where there was a lot of anti-Semitism, that's where they killed the Jews. It didn't work out that way. The problem is, is that there's a relatively constant stream of Polish nationalism. It's pretty strong everywhere. And in any case, it's hard to measure anti-Semitism. Even people who weren't voting for the nationalist parties were sometimes anti-Semitic. But what comes through super clearly in the, um, the data analysis, in those places where there were a lot of Jews, where those Jews voted heavily Zionist, and where there was at least a modicum of Poles who wanted ethnic toleration, the local nationalists went crazy. And that's where Jews were massacred. So in a way, the story we're telling is a story of competing nationalisms. What did it mean to say you were a Zionist in 1928 Poland? Right? That's an, it's a kind of an interesting question. What did it mean to say you were a Zionist? Well, here's what it did not mean. It did not mean you spoke Hebrew. Nobody spoke Hebrew. Oh, and some people could understand Hebrew, but the most Zionist papers were in Polish or Yiddish. What did it also not mean? It did not mean you were going to Eretz Israel. There was no, of course, no state of Israel. Most Jews by the 1930s couldn't get out. They couldn't go anywhere. They were stuck. So what did voting Zionist even mean? What it meant was it was a strong signal that you were not going to join the Polish or Ukrainian nation-building project. So we have data on both Polish areas and Ukrainian areas, and two elections from 1922 and 1928. And Jews who voted Zionist in those elections were essentially telling everybody locally, we are not going to join your nation-building project. As a matter of fact, we would like to pursue our interests here. Our own cultural and political autonomy. Aggressively. Right. Aggressively. And, you know, the head of the general Zionists is an interesting guy. Right. His name was Yitzhak Grunbaum. And Yitzhak Grunbaum, the Poles hated him. Right? The Ukrainians hated him, too. Why? Well, he spoke perfect Polish. He was a member of the Polish Siem, the Polish parliament. He wanted to be a minister in a Polish government. Nobody would ever accept him as a minister of Polish government. So what are the kinds of things they pursued? They wanted schooling in Jewish languages. They wanted the end of mandatory Sunday closing laws because that meant that Jews couldn't work two days of the week, Saturdays and Sundays. They wanted accommodations for Jews in the army, the use of kashrut. There was a continuous campaign to get rid of kosher butchery, kosher slaughter. It was, of course, 
articulated in the same grounds that it's articulated today for animal rights reasons. And of course, that was a, it was really an attempt to kind of cut into the Jewish domination of the meat market. Well, this so much reflects a lot of the debates we have today in modern liberal democracies who are trying to constantly balance their national values and their civic values with minority rights. You know, we see these debates in France. We see these debates in, you know, other Western democracies. Is it the same debate? Are we looking at the same question even here in Israel, of course, Arab collective minority rights? Is it the same kind of debate? Yeah, I think it's even more severe. It was even more severe then than it was in Western societies today. Just to take one of the reasons, a lot of Jews couldn't speak perfect Polish. They were easily identifiable as Jews. And of course, ultra-Orthodox religious Jews were especially easily identifiable. But I think you're right that there, it is a lot like today. This issue of minority accommodation, whose state is, is it? I mean, really, the question of democracy is who owns the state? And we, th- we tend to think of in a democracy, the people own the state. But the question is, who are the people? Who gets counted as a people? Who has membership? And the Jews were saying, the Jews who were Zionist, and it was the largest and strongest political Jewish political party of nine Jewish political parties in interwar Poland, it was the strongest. And they were, in effect, saying, we are Poles, that is, we are Polish citizens, but we are not Polish ethnics, and we are never going to be. And so let me, the interesting thing about Grunbaum, what happens to him, he leaves in 1935. He comes to the Yishuv. He comes to, you know, proto-state Israel. He eventually becomes Israel's first minister of the interior in 1948. His son stays, is captured, put in a concentration camp, survives by being a capo, survives the war, goes to Paris, comes to Israel, and dies in the war of 1948. That's a kind of amazing story, right? But Grunbaum himself, at one point in the 1930s, he was the most popular Jewish politician in the world. If you think about it, right, there was, he really was running for parliament. The Jews wanted to be cabinet ministers. Well, this raises a real question about whether it was really this demand, this very aggressive demand of Jews for social and cultural autonomy that somehow, you know, sparked or even brought these upon themselves, which I'm sure is not what you're trying to say. But Was it more that or was it more the perception of Polish nationalists that they were about to be politically replaced, which very much echoes the political debates we see in America today? Yeah. And so that word, we will not be replaced, of course, is used from the the Charlottesville, Virginia. But it's uh, also, I think, a feature in nationalist populism in general, right? Our people are losing power over our country. 100%. And so our explanation is not that in those places the Zionists did well when the Germans invaded, the Poles said, oh, look, let's go kill us some Zionists, right? That's not what was going on. What we're talking about is that was sending a signal. That was sending a signal, a signal that was different in each and every community in Poland. And so when the Germans do arrive, the question is, is there the bare minimum of solidarity? the bare minimum of solidarity to prevent the worst of this. I mean, the Germans write reports. They write these Einsatzgruppen reports back to Berlin, and they complain. They said, we can't get the locals to do this in most places, especially, for example, let's say in Belarusian communities. To they do re- what? To, to kill Jews? To kill Jews. They really wanted, and that's why we have photographs. There are YouTube videos of these pogroms. You know, the university press, <laughs> we can't publish a YouTube video in a, in a book, but you can look them up. And the Germans complained in most places they couldn't get them to do it. You can get people to hate each other, but to kill them is much harder. So what we're really talking about here is the bare minimum of communal respect, that when all the arrows were pointing in the right direction, all the arrows were pointing that way. The Germans were passing through. You had polarized politics. The Germans, all public authority had broken down. The Soviets had fled. The Soviets had, we can talk about that too. The Soviets had been in control of all this territory from 1939 to 1941. And the Jews were accused of siding with the Soviets. But when all the arrows were pointing in the right direction, the pogroms still only happen in 10% of locations. So it's very hard to get these things going. But isn't that because the Jews stopped being the primary threat on the Poles and then the German Nazis became the primary threat? Well, so it's very, it's a good question. The, it's very important to realize we're talking about the only the first six weeks of the war, right? That is from the end of June 1941 till the beginning of August 1941. After that time, the Jews are ghettoized, the SS, see, the thing is, is the SS was moving very quickly. They were following the, the German army. In end of August and beginning of September, the SS comes back and kills everybody, right? So it's not like the Jews who survived these pogroms ultimately survived the Holocaust. Most do not. 
right? But there was this interlude, this interlude in which all public authority broke down. It's important to realize the Poles did not know and the Ukrainians did not know. Normal Ukrainians and normal Poles did not know there would be a Holocaust. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what the plans were. And so that's why when people say back to us, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. How can you say that locals were using the opportunity to gain the political upper hand against their Jewish nationalist enemies? That's ridiculous. That This was about more than that. Well, yes, it was about more than that. But it was also a situation in which the locals didn't know what would happen next. They thought perhaps they were going to get control of everything. The Ukrainians certainly thought that. The Ukrainians had been promised by the Germans they would get their own state. They just had to do this one little favor for them first. And so you really have to read kind of history forward, right? You have to read it from the standpoint of the people who were there at the time. It doesn't mean you can't use social scientific methods. You can, but it makes it more understandable if you know, if you put, try to put yourself in their position and say that this is our one opportunity to do a Nakba I want against, to ask our about... Jewish, against our Jewish neighbors, if you will, right? I want to ask about one of the factors that you point out, but it doesn't necessarily seem to be the top factor in your findings. But as a political scientist myself who studies ethnic conflict, I think about this, which is the state breakdown part of it, the total breakdown of authority. And you do mention it many times. But, you know, looking at many ethnic conflicts around the world, situations of massacre and genocide and state breakup, we often find that it's because the central state is so weak. So does that rival the top factors that you found in your in your quantitative breakdown? Yes. And and clearly, if the state had still been there, right, either a Polish state, right, the Polish state that was there before, it was not it was an anti-Semitic state, but it was not a violent state, the one that was there before. Or the Germans, if you look at actually how these the interesting question, how do these pogroms come to an end? The Germans mostly bring it to an end. As a matter of fact, in many cases, and in the book we talk about this, some some especially really hard-to-read cases where local Jewish women were completely frantic as the pogroms were happening. And they approached the local German occupiers. And the German, in one case, we talk about a town, Schuchin. And this is a northeastern Poland. I'm so glad you said that because I would never would have known how to pronounce that name at that time from reading it. <laughs> learning Polish from this all, for this pro- I mean, I'd spoken Russian before, but learning Polish for this project almost did me in. So in Shuchin, what happens, the Germans pass through quickly. A local field troop puts up their flag and they're outside of the town center. And the locals start killing the Jews. The Jewish, by about seven o'clock at night, the Jewish women are frantic. And they run, first they run to the priest and the priest says, sorry, can't help you. Right. With um, indifference more than hatred. Is that what you read? That's absolutely. What you, read. With an, I'm, you read it closely. That's good. I with did. indifference more than hatred. And then they ran to the town intelligentsia, which in that place mostly means kind of, you know, lawyers, school teachers, veterinarians. Also, no help whatsoever. Of course, because they're afraid themselves. They're in a context in which it could be dangerous for them to do anything. Or they hated Jews. One of the two. We don't really know. Or both. Or both. Or both. Exactly. And then what happens? They go to the Germans. The Germans at first say, look, this is a local affair. We are soldiers at the front. We're fighting, right? They Remember, they're not SS. They're just normal Wehrmacht soldiers. And then one of the women, women reports, and this was a testimony right after the war, she says, and then we offered the Germans soap and coffee. And that, Which you put in quotation marks. Yeah, because, you know, I'm a guy. I'm stupid, right? So I had to read soap and coffee many times before I... Then I started doing a little more research. And the problem is, is this is the third day of the war. They had soap and coffee. Soap and coffee obviously meant something else. The feet in the Bible. Yes, exactly. And then, and then there's another testimony which talks about the most beautiful women of the Jewish community went to work for the Germans. So we clearly know there was an element of, I, not clearly know, we don't clearly know anything, but it strongly implies there's an, a degree of sexual slavery in the stopping of these pogroms. People did what they had to do to survive. I want to ask you about something that occurred to me. I know you focused on why there weren't more in some ways, given the circumstances, but still we're trying to understand the people who did this and these situations of neighbors. And I can't help but think about the thesis of Christopher Browning, the ordinary men, the, the capacity of regular people to accept this, to allow it to happen, and to do it, and to perpetrate it. How does your research interact with that? Does it affirm that approach or somehow contradict it? So it both affirms and contradicts it. (laughs) As a a good social scientist. scientist. Well, first of all, there were there weren't just a few pogroms. We found, and we probably didn't get all of them, right? We found two hundred and nineteen pogroms out of about twenty three hundred places. So about nine or ten percent. Obviously we didn't find pogroms where everybody died and there were no witnesses. 
right? So we probably missed some. So the question is, is it like, so Browning argues that, look, anybody could do this. So the question is, is there some kind of sociological category which describes the pogromist? Were they rich? Were they poor? Were they anti-Semitic? Were they not anti-Semitic? Were they rural? Were they urban? That defies generalization. Browning argues that it's ordinary people. We agree with that. It was ordinary people. You had priests involved in these pogroms. You had lawyers involved in these pogroms. Of course, you had any number of peasants. So peasant, it was quite common for peasants from the surrounding community to come in with carts to grab Jewish stuff, right? And the locals, of course, were grabbing Jewish apartments. And Which those, makes it look like economic motivations. There are, there are, and that's a whole other thing we can talk about, right? So econo- how do we control for economic motivations? But the fact of the matter is that you had human subjectivity is a gigantic mess. And there were all kinds of motives for these pogroms, right? You had, you know, sexual depravity. You had economic motives. You have the political motives that we talk about. The question, so what we're really pointing to is not so much the individual motivations, which I think are multiple, but the communal factors that either allowed these motivations to be acted upon or not. In some places... Where people wanted to start pogroms, the local said, no, you can't do that. We hate them too, but you can't do that. It would be the unchristian thing to do. So the places where pogroms started to happen but didn't are equally as interesting from a social scientific point as where they did. So I just want to ask you a request. Could you please write your next book about that? <laughs> where they Those almost- people who said no. Those you people can't do who this said in our town. That. Yeah, and you know, there are people who research people who resist violence. It's very hard to find in the documents the dog that didn't bark, right? You know, explaining something that didn't happen. We do explain things that don't happen by reference to previously existing political factors and socio-demographic factors back into the 1920s. I mean, that's what's kind of interesting about the book is that in some ways things that happened relatively long time before these pogroms set the tone. They set the tone. And we've always kind of known that from the memoirs where people would say, oh, yeah, that's a social democratic village. Oh, that's a right wing village. Don't go there. Right. So we've always known that. But I think this book is the first one to kind of systematically connect the dots between kind of the legacies of the past. Uh, I want to ask you about the contemporary implications of what you say. I mean, uh, um, Dalia touched upon it before, but I want to go back to it uh, while focusing on the competing nationalisms concept here, as the Jews being wedged between the Polish and the Ukrainian nationalism and all the mess that erupts from it. Do you think that this is really what dictates to a large extent Jewish politics today? I mean, looking at Trump's America and the rising the rise of ethno-nationalism, liberal Jews immediately resort to this position of, you know, even if ethno-nationalism is not directed at us directly, soon enough, as Jews, will be the primary victims of that. Do you see that as a direct result of the period that you're describing in your book? Well, it would take a lot for there to be pogrom like that in the United States. But let me give you a kind of a hypothetical. And we thought about this. I mean, we did a couple of pieces in the Washington Post kind of talking about the book and talking about the discourse in Poland about the book, about the, the general issue of the pogroms, right? And one of the things we were thinking about writing about, but we didn't, and that was picture Charlottesville, where you had this, you know, right-wing riot where somebody got killed. A bunch of right-wing nationalists. This is, you know, a little more than a year ago. In and the very much States. in response to a demonstration by people that they felt and perceived were taking over their political hegemony. That's where they said, you will not replace us. The Jews will not replace us. What if Charlottesville had not been a small liberal university town? But it had been a, a rural town that was deeply divided between black and white. And over that was a kind of a deep cleavage between Republicans and Democrats. And the cops had said, we're not going to have any. The police had said, we're not going to do anything about this. We're just going to hang back. We're going to stay back. And you have one further factor, right? You have some central authority who says to the locals, just go for it. Just do whatever you'd like, right? Get rid of your enemies. You know, you're going to be in charge. You're going to be in back in the driver's seat again. Which is how many Jews interpreted Trump's position. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is you know, this is a, a slightly different conversation. I mean, you know, m- my life in North America has largely been one of 
ever-increasing openness. When I was a little boy, there were clubs that Jews couldn't go to. There are areas of towns where Jews couldn't live. That's all kind of gone. The Jews have been kind of huge, both political and distributional beneficiaries of liberal democracy in the United States. There's no doubt about that. Right. Even the Goyim would say that's a shanda now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, the, I mean, the idea that we're going to bring all of that into question, right, it's kind of renationalize. Well, what if somebody says, oh, you know, are you Jewish or American? Which one are you? But this that goes question back to- could get put on the table. And that does go back to what we are talking about in the book. Are you Jewish or are you a Pole? Right. And you couldn't be both. But the ultimate deciding factor, and you mentioned it twice now, one is the police and one is the central government. It seems to me we're still going back to the fact that human nature can lead us to all of these terrible situations. But the fact that there's a state authority in place is ultimately like the buck stops there. Yes. And the, the, I mean, the state in most respects, not all, I'm a Hobbesian, right? And I think Jason is too. And that's the idea that the state is a good thing. The state prevents the worst sorts of violence. It prevents our worst kind of instincts from being, we can't act on them as easily. And the absence of the state certainly permits that. And it was a, definitely a necessary condition for these kinds of things to occur. You can have situations in which the police and the state do act against the minority population. That can happen, right? That happened in Rwanda, for example, right? The local state authorities, right, acted against the Hutu, local Hutu state authorities acted against the Tutsis. That can happen. Well, that's actually exactly the next question that I have, which was kind of building on Gilad's question about the contemporary implications. I want to know about the comparable implications. Can we use this model, at least the methodology and maybe some of the conclusions, to explain neighbor-to-neighbor violence in the two most kind of prominent contemporary experiences, Rwanda and Yugoslavia. And I'm thinking about Hebron of 1929 and perhaps Iraq of ni- the early 1950s. Well, there's a great... So let's go to, the, to Gilad's point first. Oh, start with the easy ones. <laughs> there's a great book to be written about 36 through 39 in 1929, right? In the issue of... There's a, there's a great book to be written about that. What explains the variation in both the onset and the distribution of violence? And I know there are people who are thinking about doing this. You could apply exactly this methodology. If you had, you know, decent kinds of indicators, which I think exist, you could apply that and you could do that. Another, let me go, one more historical example, which we explicitly talk about in the book, lynching in the United States. A third of all counties in the United States never had a lynching. And it just so happens... That doesn't sound like very much to me. Two-thirds did? A third in the South, in the post-bellum South. Yes, two-thirds did. It 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 was quite common. Now, we're talking about counties, not towns. We don't have better data. We don't have as good data about lynching as we have about these pogroms. Right. That is, historians haven't done it. It's still work to be done. However, it does appear that, though this is contested, but a good part of the historiography on lynching argues that the number of blacks and the blacks vote for the Republican Party. Remember, at that time, the Republicans were the... Um, party of Lincoln. The, the party of Lincoln, the party of tolerance, the party of black civil rights. So the where lynching occurs can be tied back to socio-demographic and political factors in that area. The same goes with uh, Hindu-Muslim violence in contemporary India. So we talk about both those cases in the book. Yugoslavia, Dahlia's questioning, and Rwanda. You know, I've read the literature on Rwanda pretty carefully. I teach it because I want to learn more about the dirty secret that professors, whenever they want to learn about something, they teach it. And so I've been teaching about the Rwandan genocide. And one thing that doesn't get discussed but is usually mentioned in the literature, before the genocide happens, it was the era of mass politics. You had parties running against each other, and the elections themselves tended to be ethnic censuses. That is to say, you could tell how many Hutus and Tutsis lived in the country based on the performance of the political parties, which largely broke down along those lines. Yugoslavia as well, too. The fear always in the modern world, right, is that control, ownership in the state is subject to democratic elections. And those democratic elections are about mobilizing demographic groups into politics. And when society is divided up, when the primary cleavage is not class, is not region, but ethnic group, that's when democracies can become dangerous. That's when elections can become just as much a source of animosity as they are legitimacy. But I have to just say a follow-up to that, because what you're really saying is that there's a transition to a competition between those groups, to a political competition. Yes. And that there's a competition for power, and it runs along ethnic lines. Yes, and it runs along ethno-democratic lines, in fact, right? And so sometimes, you know, look, you can say for the Jews, historically, democracy has not always been the friend of the Jews, right? And that's not that, not that Jews are anti-democratic. It's just that when you're a minority and there's a popular election, things don't always go your way. 
And it's just like in Israel today, democracy, if Israel would miraculously only have elections within 1967 borders, democracy would not necessarily be the friend of the Arab population, right? For any minority. It's already not. Well, that's a different question, Uh, right? (laughs) I'd like to ask you one last question because we are quickly running out of time. It's what your research means for the contemporary debate on the responsibility of the Poles during the Second World War. Because in a way, it both is an indictment of them and exonerates them to a certain degree. It's a very important question. Recently, this last January, the Poles passed a law Right, which Israel got involved in this law. Um, so, in a surprising direction. Yes. I mean, this does speak to Israeli contemporary politics as well. So quickly, Poland passed a law basically saying you can't use the word Polish death camp, which was semi, semi-ridiculous because nobody, you, no scholars use the word Polish death camp. Some people do, but they mean death camps that were on Poland. But they were worried about that. And the second thing is you couldn't defame the Polish nation. If you did, you were subject to up to three years imprisonment. I said to myself, well, there goes the book tour in Poland, right? So then Jason and I, we wrote a a Washington Post article uh, saying that you can't legislate the past like this. And then we realized that within the legislation, it said there was an exemption for scholarship, but not for journalism. But we had just broken the law by publishing the, the article in the Washington Post. But what's interesting for Israel... The the Israeli Academy mostly uniformly condemned this. Yad Vashem historians condemned it, except the leadership and the Israeli government. They started to negotiate with the Polish government about the exact wording. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has taken the position of these governments might in some way be anti-Semitic, but they're pro-Israel. And for kind of real politique reasons, they've decided, look, Israel can't choose its friends, and therefore anybody who's friends with Israel, it's more important that they are good for living Jews than for dead Jews, right? And I mean, that's stated in its most cynical way, but you can kind of understand it in its own terms. But that's really, in contemporary Poland, the current Polish government, the previous Polish government under Alexander President Kwasniewski He not only went to Yedvabne, this village that started this whole debate, marked it properly and apologized, right? The current Polish government has taken the completely the opposite tack. They say, look, this either was done by the Germans or it was exaggerated or if it was done, the Jews deserved to have it done because they sided with the Soviets when the Soviets had occupied this territory. So that's really where the debate is in Poland today. It's deeply divisive. In a way, the Polish government has taken a step backwards. The Ukrainian government has taken has never even moved down this road. The Ukrainian government denies all of this. They, they valorize their World War II collaborationist government, a guy named Stepan Bandera, who was armed, fed, and watered by the Nazis. So the Polish government is, is, has moved forward and then back, and that's where things sit today. We have a lot to think about from this art on many levels, both for Jewish and Israel issues and for politics of global conflict. Thank you, Jeffrey Kopstein, for being on the show. You've been talking about your recently published book, Intimate Violence, co-authored with Jason Wittenberg. Thanks also to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, and to Itai Shelem, our producer, and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. Now a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we'd like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. You can also support us by going to our website, tlv1.fm slash review and subscribing on our Patreon campaign. We've got gifts and perks. And for anybody, you can check out our archive with almost 500 interviews. Please like us on Facebook. We're called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast Ideas from Israel. Follow me and Gilad on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye.